This is the Distinguished Lecture Series from the in, uh, Institute on Ecosystems. I'm Bruce Maxwell, Director, MSU Director of the Institute on Ecosystems. Is this loud enough? Can everybody hear me? Okay. Uh, tonight, we have Clayton Marlowe with us, and it's uh, a real pleasure to, to have Clayton speak to us. I've known Clayton for a long time, as long as I've been at MSU, really which goes back quite a while. Um, in fact, he was a professor here when I was a graduate student, so uh, it's great to, great to have Clayton talk to us. He's a, he's a professor in the Department of Animal and Range Science. Um, his research interests are focused on enumeration and description of the cumulative effects of grazing, wildfire suppression, and habitat preservation on the physical and biological processes that create and sustain and sustain lodic riparian ecosystems. Cool. His research has been published in a variety of journals, including Rangelands, Journal of American Water Resources Association, North American Journal of Fisheries Management, and the Journal of Environmental Management, among others. So he's across the environmental sciences as much as anybody. As a professor, Dr. Marlowe is interested in preparing students to advance the conservation of natural resources in those families and communities that rely on agriculture, fishing, hunting, logging, and ecotourism. Again, very diverse. Uh, his teaching goals uh, are twofold. He wants to train students to understand ecological processes and how these processes are affected by management actions. And he wants to help students use this knowledge to build a framework for problem solving that sustain ecosystems and communities. So, um, very much in line with the, with the land grant mission. Uh, Dr. Marlowe received an MS in Forest and Range Management from Washington State University, a PhD in Range Management from the University of Wyoming. So he's a regional guy. Um, he currently serves as the Vice President of the Society of Range Management in the past has served on the Board of Directors of the Society of Range Management and Northwest Science Association. So join me in welcoming Clayton. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Can you hear me like that? Good. Uh, I've off except Tad. <laughs> you. Okay, and she says I'll have to use the microphone. My, my problem, or I should say my problem, I always like to move around because a moving target's harder to hit. <laughs> so, but to help you here, I will stay here as, as much as possible. I really appreciate this opportunity to be here. Uh, it is a privilege, and I hope you will come away from it with some enlightenment uh, and hopefully not brain damage by, by listening to what I have to say. This is the uh, accumulation of a number of years that I've had the good fortune to work in the various ecosystems that surround and make up the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And I might just put a quick caveat on it. You notice the words Lodic riparian system. I really started out working in stream systems in riparian areas. And the first dozen or so years, I spent all of my time wading around in the creek, getting wet uh, and muddy before I finally figured out that if we were really going to conserve and protect our fisheries in our riparian areas, we had to start in the watershed. And what was happening in the grasslands and the forests uh, on the farm fields and on the ranches are as important to the health and processes of the riparian areas anything. So I diverged out uh, and I'm working in some of these other systems uh, and I, I think it's helped me better understand uh, how water runs downhill. So let me begin now with this presentation. Uh, it's not going to be a presentation about whether or not there's climate change. I think there's sufficient information out there that would certainly indicate to us that our planet is warming. What I'm hoping to do is to uh, enliven you to the opportunities we have to mitigate and cope with uh, 
the results of temperature rise, shifts in uh, precipitation patterns that are going to be associated with climate uh, change. And in fact, what I'm going to argue for is that we really need, as both a local community and a regional community, to become actively involved in adaptive management, in figuring out what we're going to do uh, and how we're going to approach the conservation of the wildlife and natural resources base here that brought us to Bozeman, that makes Bozeman and the surrounding area a popular place to live. I don't think I have to tell anybody here, but just to give us a, a flow, the Greater Yellowstone uh, ecosystem is certainly renowned for its geologic and natural features. Uh, based on my experience, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem, for example, is home to probably one of the only free roaming herds of bison in North America depending upon what APR pulls off the next decade. But I'm also going to try to convince you this evening that that great diversity of wildlife, those populations are due largely to the diverse and sustainable plant communities that make up the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Without these plant communities, all we're going to have is uh, geysers and shopping malls. Here is in very general uh, terms, here's what is expected to happen in the next 40 to 60 years in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Now for young people like me, <clears throat> that's going to be just around the corner, okay? Certainly what we're going to experience are earlier springs. They're going to be wetter. In fact, this June, May and June would be a good example. A tremendous amount of precipitation during May and June. Very cool. And then what happened after June? We turned off the valve, little to no precipitation. It was warm and dry, okay? It's in all likelihood we'll have warmer winters, okay? Meaning a smaller snowpack, a snowpack that lasts for a shorter period of time. And because of that, the map, this multicolored map, I'm gonna run away here for a moment. This multicolored map represents the anticipated change in suitable habitat for our big four forest species. Lodgepole pine, uh, Engelmann spruce, uh, Douglas fir, and ponderosa pine. I wish my old friend Hal Hunter was here. Uh, I enjoy greatly teasing Hal about the fact that Douglas fir should be listed as the next noxious weed in the state of Montana. And that always immediately made him stand up on his tiptoes and get red faced. And, the conversation went on, but he had good reason for it. On the left hand side, uh, you can see the various colors suggesting where the suitable habitat for these four tree species will be. By 2060, if you listen to the most recent climate change uh, forecasts, we might back this off to 2040 bring it a little uh, closer. That map on the right hand side with those big open spaces does not mean we're not going to have lodgepole pine or ponderosa pine or Douglas fir forests in those areas. I, I want to make that very clear because what that map is showing ties in with the rest of what I'm going to talk about. That map suggests that because of global climate change, the habitat suitable to regenerate, to start new stands of lodgepole, new stands of Douglas fir, new Engelmann spruce, new uh, Douglas fir, 
will be gone. They're going to migrate to the north and west, further up the Rocky Mountains into the Idaho Panhandle, into Alberta. So think of those big open spaces as literally that, open spaces for new plant communities. When the forests can no longer regenerate themselves, what is going to move in to replace them? And I'm going to submit to you that currently it will be grass and shrublands, grass and shrub communities uh, that will move in to take the place of these forests that can no longer reestablish themselves. And what might these new grasslands look like? Well, I think we have some very reasonable analogs right here around the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We have these Douglas fir meadows that uh, any of you that are bow hunters have been sneaking around in the last three or four weeks, hoping to lure a bull out. Uh, but it could also be the Great Basin sagebrush com community moving up out of Idaho, out of Utah, and out of Nevada. And it could also be the Palouse Prairie type, moving out of eastern Oregon and Washington uh, through Idaho and beginning to occupy this vacated space. The next, but <clears throat> as I point this out to you, I, I put together this little, uh, I guess kind of awkward model, trying to tie together a lot of very complex uh, physical and biological processes that are all interacting to produce these grasslands, to produce an open space because these conditions are changing uh, and so the conifers can't exist there anymore. So overarching everything, just like we're talking about, is climate, okay? Climate is the great ruling factor. But within climate, we have wet dry cycles. Uh, that's the ecological term for drought and above normal precipitation. Certainly the geology uh, and then the aspect, north facing, south facing slopes. As those interact together, Dr. Hartzorn, I hope I'm correct on this, we have soil. When we begin to have a unique set of soils developed. Once that template is established, and the reason I put these next three in bright colors is this is what we're looking at. This is what I will suggest that these are the tools we have to conserve and protect these grasslands as they expand in to occupy new areas. Because if these grasslands and native shrublands don't move in to fill the vacancy, what will? Annual bromes. Uh, I was in Wyoming two weeks ago. They're struggling now with Medusa head, another annual grass leafy spurge, spotted knapweed, all sorts of non-native invasive, quickly and ready to fill in. So if nothing else besides our wildlife, we want to conserve these grasslands and enable them to continue to sustain themselves just to keep the non-native invasives out. So drought, wildfire and grazing, I would submit to you, are major factors at the local and regional level that have shaped and continue to shape our grass and shrublands. Doesn't mean that they're always in drought, it doesn't mean that they're always burning, it doesn't mean that they're always grazing, but it is the interaction and the interval between fires and droughts and grazing that shapes these unique grasslands gives them the character that we're so interested in. So what can we affect in our conservation? Yeah, probably not drought so much, but certainly we have a hand with wildfire and we hand with, have a hand on grazing. So let's look at a very fine scale uh, 
view of these different grasslands and what makes me bold enough to say that I think the Palouse Prairie will probably win the fight for these vacated spaces. Um, the Great Basin communities, the sagebrush dominated communities, that gray line down at the bottom, are characterized by winter snow, dry summers, and of course very little precipitation, but they rely very heavily on that winter snowpack. The Palouse Prairie, the uh, orange line, represents these wet, mild winters, what's the climate model say for the greater Yellowstone, at least a mild winter, and very, very dry summers. The other line, the greater Yellowstone Western Montana communities, is actually uh, a, an average between Cody, Wyoming and West Yellowstone. And notice where the peak precipitation comes roughly that descending limb of the Palouse Prairie. It doesn't match the Great Basin climate patterns. So I'm going to suggest that the winning grassland, the shape of the grassland community, is likely to be this Palouse Prairie, this bunch grass system. And here's some data to, to back up my argument. This is some information, or I shouldn't say some information, these are the dominance in four of the large vegetation communities that we have inventoried in the Gardner Basin. The Basin Big Sagebrush community type, the Mountain Big Sagebrush community type, the Black Sagebrush community type, and the grasslands. And what I'm trying to point out to you here is Basin Big Sagebrush uh, is a, an element of the Great Basin, uh, as is the uh, rubber rabbit brush way down there at the bottom. Okay, not very common in the Gardner Basin, but it's still there. Mountain Big Sagebrush is also a dominant in the Great Basin. But look at the, all the other grass and forb species. These are all elements of the Palouse Prairie. These are the dominant grasses, Idaho fescue, blue bunch wheatgrass, Sandberg bluegrass, June grass, um, and I have to pause here while I'm reading off all these grass names. Uh, one of my children sent me a, a picture the other day on the internet to remind me their traumatic childhood as we would go on hikes and I would name all the grasses that were out there. And, and this picture was two mason jars with a taped on label on each one, and one mason jar had swear words, and there were just a few coins in it. And the other mason jar was nearly full with plant names that weren't asked for. <laughs> so I, I have been unable to break that habit. The whole purpose for this slide is, is to further reinforce that what we find in the Gardner Basin is largely already the Palouse Prairie. It simply has an overstory of Great Basin shrubs. Okay. So climate change goes through. It's likely that the grasses will dominate and the shrubs will retreat. So the first thing we begin to talk about, this is 60 year old data, okay, from a series of grazing exclosures built in the upper Gallatin. Uh, Jerry Nielsen's up there, he's very familiar with this situation. Uh, there was a great deal of concern in the late 40s and early 50s about all the elk starving to death in the upper Gallatin. There are all sorts of horror pictures of, of starving elk scattered across the hillsides, uh, emaciated elk standing in the rivers, and the Forest Service and Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks were encouraged by the public to step in and do something. And they tried to do a lot of things, but in the process, they built a series of large exclosures. Okay, these were 10 and 12 foot high uh, fences surrounding one to two acres. And at the time these were built, it was felt 
The grazing pressure was not necessarily a natural part of the ecosystem. And that what managers had to learn how to do was reduce grazing pressure to the level that allowed the plant community to exist. So uh, a number of years ago, several of my graduate students, one of them, Nato Garcia, is here, and I were invited by both the Forest Service and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to reevaluate those exclosures. Uh, so they gave us all their files. We dug around and dug around in their files, and we were able to find maps for each of the exclosures indicating where they had placed their original vegetation inventory transects. So we went back into this terrible, terrible environment. Just awful to have to work there. <laughs> and uh, uh, relocated those transects and collected the vegetation in exactly the same manner that the agencies had done. So what we have is 1958, that's when most of the exclosures were put in, uh, except Crown Butte was actually built in 1951. So we have a 60 year record of no grazing and no fire on these plant communities. Okay, and I picked the two dominant grasses of the Palouse Prairie, Idaho fescue and blue bunch wheatgrass that I already showed you the few charts. I think I'm justified in focusing on these to show you what happened under climate only effects, which would be inside the exclosure and climate plus grazing outside the exclosure. So we begin in the late 50s, early 60s, and through 1976, we see a general increase in Idaho fescue and blue bunch wheatgrass in these exclosures. Now, what's the reason for the big gap between 76 and 2013? Essentially, the Forest Service lost the resources necessary to continue to inventory these exclosures. In fact, the reason we were invited to participate or to do this work was the Forest Service was seriously considering removing the exclosures, tearing them out. So the reason for the big gap, and I really wish, if you look at Teepee Creek, I really wish we'd have been able to have had more data. Teepee Creek, when we returned to it, we could not locate all of the pins for those transects. So that's why we had to end with the 1984 data collection at Teepee Creek. Crown Butte, we were able to find the pins. So the take home message from this is that if you say sometime roughly between 1976 and 2014, the effect of global warming kicks in and we really begin to see a ramping up of temperatures, notice what happens, let's start with Crown Butte. Without grazing the blue bunch wheatgrass in there continues to increase, indicating it can deal with the signals from climate change. However, outside the exclosure, where we have climate change plus grazing, we see sagebrush take over and dominate, and blue bunch wheatgrass actually decline. So grazing superimposed on climate change is having an effect on that plant community. All I can say about Teepee Creek is that the patterns we see in Teepee Creek roughly follow those same ones that we found at Wapiti and Crown Butte. That once the area was protected from excessive grazing, then we see the grasses begin to recover and Wapiti is, is just, I think, a very, very clear example that under climate change, 
scenarios, Idaho fescue is actually coping very well with the changing climate. It, it's going to stay there. Blue bunch wheatgrass may not be as effective in coping with the new signals. However, look what happens when we introduce grazing into that system. Blue bunch wheatgrass, not as capable of dealing with the new climate signal, disappears. It's still in there. It declined, but it's still in there after our climate change patterns really start to kick in. So we begin, I would submit to you, to see the fact that these Palouse Prairie dominants, at least Idaho fescue, can deal with increasing temperatures. Blue Bunch, on the other hand, may not deal with it as well, and certainly when we introduce grazing, those differences are pronounced. So the opportunity for these grasses to recover meets the current models. We're going to have these very wet springs, Idaho fescue, blue bunch wheatgrass, evolved in the Palouse Prairie environment of very wet springs and very dry summers. And I'm excited to say, and look at that. In the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, they do the same thing. They're responding to wet springs and dry summers. Idaho fescue, apparently better at it than blue bunch wheatgrass. In the upper Gallatin, grazing depressed the ability of these two species, certainly blue bunch wheatgrass, to cope with and recover. Conversely, it promoted the increase in sagebrush cover. Interesting switch. So let's look at another area. Let's move across the mountains into the Gardner Basin a very unknown, unvisited, non-controversial area, right? It's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> so our first database, again, at invitation from the Custer Gallatin Forest, we were able, well, I shouldn't say we, I sent an undergraduate student desperately in need of groceries <laughs> So I paid him a little bit. I sent him over to Livingston and Gardner, where he sat for hours digging through the old files. And whenever he found a range inventory for one of the grazing allotments in the Gardner Basin, he copied the material and brought it back, and we put it together as best we could. <clears throat> so again, most of the inventories by the Forest Service began, began in the late 50s, early 60s. This is basin wide. This is not for, uh, there were nine livestock grazing allotments in the Gardner Basin. So that's why we have things like 68, 69, 70, 75, 76, 78, was because I was having to pool data from two or three allotments for that period of time because the Forest Service was not consistently uh, collecting their data. So this is the combination of blue bunch wheatgrass, Idaho fescue, and a few native needle grasses that are considered by ecologists to be climax, to be those species that represent a community in balance with the climate and soil factors. So in 1958, 19 60 period we have about 20 percent of the plant community is made up of these climax species 1962 1963 we see a significant depression in these climax species okay and that's why that star is there that's a highly significant difference 68 69 70 we see these grasses begin to recover in these grassland communities but in 1985 we see another depression in these climax grasses 2014 look at the rebound by 2014 we're actually seeing 
more climax species in those grassland communities that were there in 1958. I, th I think that says, I can say pretty comfortably, that that indicates uh, that these grassland communities have improved during that period of time. Now, I've been talking all this time. I'm going to stop for a second, and I'm going to ask you what you think is causing these significant depressions in 62 and 85. These are livestock grazing allotments. Cattle, well, uh, mostly cattle. There were a few sheep bands in there, yes. Yeah, yeah. Good point, good question. So what does this represent? Yes, sir. Was uh, direct control of the elk population ended in 62? Almost. Harold, correct me. <clears throat> but the last major direct control of the elk by the Park Service was in 67, 68. Okay. And what prompted that last major control was these conditions right here. So they went in in 67 and made a pretty dr drastic reduction in the elk population. We see some rebound. What happens by 95? Or 85, I'm sorry, thank you. Can't read my own graph. What happens by 85? A lot of bison outside the park. Yeah, well, okay. And I wasn't allowed to have the bison data, but there's the elk data. <laughs> oh, he said there were a lot of bison outside the park. Oh, okay. So here's fish, wildlife, and parks elk numbers for the Gardner Basin during that period of time. <clears throat> and I don't think we're pushing things too hard to say that these changes and that grassland community reflect the populations of elk in the Gardner Basin. The other kicker, and I, Neto, correct me on this, most of the livestock grazing allotments are done by here. There's no, very few, if any, livestock still grazing in the Gardner Basin. So openly and objectively, we get a double whammy in here. The wolf is reintroduced 10 years later. We begin to see the impact of wolves on uh, the elk movement, elk patterns. We've pulled livestock out of the area. And that plant community responds. Look at that. Look at that very real response. And what's going on? Climate change. Climate change is going on. And yet we reduce grazing pressure on these grasslands, and what did they do? <coughs> I'm trying to create the argument these grass communities can respond to climate change. Yes, sir. Did you have a question? Uh, oh, okay. <coughs> so we took uh, the mountain big sagebrush community types, which are the most common community types in the Gardner Basin. 70, we inventoried 76 or 79 sites throughout the Gardner Basin. And this is the summary of that data of the dominant plant uh, species in those sites. Mucumer and Stewart, this was a major effort by the Forest Service to create what they refer to as a reference state for grassland communities in western Montana. The Gardner Basin does not have those big exclosures that the Upper Gallatin does. So we couldn't go to an exclosure to get a picture of what these grassland sagebrush communities could look like. So the best reference we have is to compare these communities that we inventoried 2014 to 2017 in the Gardner Basin with the Mugler and Stewart standard. 
Mugler and Stewart standards says that's an ecologically sustainable community. And again, I get excited because look at what is happening to these communities in the Gardner Basin versus their potential. Okay? We have half of the Idaho fescue, about the same amount of sagebrush, blue bunch wheatgrass, contrary to the upper Gallatin, seems to hang on in this environment. And if we have time for questions afterwards, we could talk about that. <coughs> but the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that even with that release, the release hasn't brought these communities back to their potential. Maybe climate change has set a ceiling. Maybe that's as far as these communities can go. Only time will tell. Okay, they continue in the Gardner Basin. They continue to uh, be the dominance in those communities. Idaho fescue can probably still adapt to climate changes better than blue bunch. But the big thing in the Gardner Basin is heavy grazing even limits Idaho fescue's ability to adapt to new conditions. So I hope you're beginning to pick up on a trend. What are we going to do to conserve these grasslands? To help them continue to move in to these vacated spots to keep the invasive weeds out. They seem, these dominant grasses seem to demonstrate the capacity based on our data to withstand climate change. Unless we have excessive grazing. Now here's some work, where's Noah? I saw you sneak in, okay. So if there's anything with, wrong with this, it's graduate student <laughs> Noah Davis's data. He, he was kind enough to to let me borrow this. We move a little bit out of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem to the Red Bluff Research Ranch, which consider, anybody in here born in 1958? Okay, good. You, you must be incredible people because all this cool range stuff happened in 1958 because this ranch was deeded over to Montana State University in 1958. And E.J. Dykster House, who began to develop the concept of range condition from ecological communities, set up a series of permanent rangeland monitoring points uh, across Red Bluff Ranch. And if you've ever worked out there and stumbled around out there, regularly you run across this old weathered steel post stuck in the ground. It's like, what's Marlowe been doing? But it's, it's not my fault. These were the Dykster House uh, sampling points. By sheer coincidence, one day over here in the MSU library, digging around for information on something else, I read across an archived report that Dr. Dykster House made, and it had a map inventorying which of those sampling points was which, and I had the database so Noah was kind enough to work with me on this project and with a lot of uh, sweating and cussing and, and scratching his head, you know, he, he used to uh, be 6'9 and he shrunk <laughs> because of all the abuse. He went out and relocated, what was it, 12 of those sites, Noah? And then resampled them exactly following uh, Dr. Dykster, well, as close as we could interpret from Dr. Dykster House's uh, comments and notes. And here we are, out just immediately outside of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, but we still find a community dominated by blue bunch wheatgrass, Idaho fescue. We see a few of the northern mixed grass prairie species sneaking in, blue grama and needle and thread. The graph simply shows you, if you don't like the tables, the graph shows you the same thing. 
over 60 years, 59 years to be exact, of light to moderate livestock grazing, that plant community recovered. Even in the face of climate change. The one interesting thing that comes up in our data that may be reflective of climate change is the increase in annual groves out there. We have to get a, a, a handle on that. But nonetheless, after heavy, heavy sheep grazing on that ranch, look at the recovery. Even in the face of climate change, those species still recover. And Noah went through and dug out the, the precipitation data, and I don't think we need to run statistics on that. The rainfall in 2017 was almost exactly the same thing it had been in 1958. Okay, So rising temperatures, but same rainfall, light to moderate livestock grazing. A lot of sheep. It was a sheep. It was a sheep operation, yes, ma'am. And she brings up a good point. We still have sheep there. We have about still have about a thousand head of sheep, but we also have what, Tom, 150 mama cows. <clears throat> but the whole point for Red Bluff is here's a long, long term database, light to moderate grazing, and those grasses are still there and they increased following their release from heavy use by sheep. <clears throat> just put into words what I just said. Okay, so the point I'm trying to get to is these grasses are flexible if they don't have to deal with excessive grazing. But remember one of the other legs on that three-legged stool was wildfire. In this environment, in the greater Yellowstone environment, pre-settlement, pretty good database to indicate those inland Douglas fir or Zarek sites burned at about a 28-year interval. And as I always tell my students, that doesn't mean the forest burned down. 69% of the fires were like that one in the picture. It was an understory fire. It went through, burned the grasses, the forbs, the little trees down, and we're left with this Douglas fir savanna in which even I could shoot an elk, because you can see them. Our lodgepole communities, on the other hand, the Yellowstone Plateau, what we saw in 90, or in 88, 73% of the fires, or yeah, 70, 3% of the fires burn as stand replacing, burn all the trees out. But that occurs at about a 170 to 200 year interval for those stands to, to burn. Okay, big deal. Where am I going with all of this? Well, in the understory, particularly the Douglas fir, we have, guess what? Our two dominant grasses again, Idaho fescue, and blue bunch wheatgrass. And the two big take home messages from all this noise is that spring burns, remember climate change is going to make our fire season start earlier. And because it's warmer, it's going to burn uh, more severely. These charts, all this research in Idaho, Montana, Western Montana indicates that neither Idaho fescue nor blue bunch wheatgrass do very well if they're burned in the spring. If they're burned late summer or fall, they can handle it. They're fire tolerant. But now here's, uh, nature is really fun. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Every time you think you've got a rule, then you turn the corner and she just turns your rule over. Because I've been telling you these grasses can handle uh, climate change really well if the grazing is light, but now we discover another problem. If these bunches get 
very, very big because of release from grazing pressure, they now are more easily damaged by fire in 25 to 30 years for those grasses to come back. And I would submit to you that it's not only that that clump of Idaho fescue is big, but it's full of dead stems from previous years. The smaller bunches with less litter are burned. They can recover in four to five years. Ah, so here's our no such thing as a free lunch. All of a sudden, Marlo, you've got to have grazing in these systems because what it does is it insulates these grasses, so to speak, from negative effects of fire. Blue bunch wheatgrass, now all of a sudden under fire, we see blue bunch wheatgrass comes back faster than Idaho fescue. Ah, more fire prone environment, more blue bunch wheatgrass. But what? More dead stems in it, less grazing pressure, it's now more susceptible to damage by fire. So the end point is, these grassland communities have to be grazed. <clears throat> Under climate change, this is really, uh, if I'm familiar with and work with anything that spells out climate change, it's right here. Our fires are getting larger, they're starting earlier, they're burning later into the year. This <coughs> multicolored Inferno on the right, the 515, the 656%, those are model-driven estimates about how likely these areas are to experience large, severe fires. Not that it's going to be burn 600%, it's just that 600% more likely to experience a large, severe fire. And if you notice where the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is, and we're talking about our forest retreating because of climate change, 515% more likely to burn in a severe fire. Next big fires, our forests may not be able to recover. Okay? we're going to see earlier, more frequent, and more severe fires. Instead of 170 year intervals, we may see lodgepole pine burning at 50 and 60 year intervals. Instead of 20 to 40 year intervals for Douglas fir, we may see them burn at four and five year intervals. It's what climate change is driving us to. Under that scenario then, realistically, even though I showed you that these grasses can cope with climate change under light to moderate grazing, when you superimpose fire on top of that, now they've lost the fight. There won't be enough time for those grasses to recover before the next fire. <clears throat> but, our adaptation, our conservation is that we can do something about it. In our grasslands, oops, have to go back. In our, ah, there we go. In our grasslands, those exposures that we measured are actually very, very vulnerable to fire now because of no grazing. We've learned over time that as we pull grazing out of these environments, they become more susceptible to damage from fire. Our sagebrush systems, that sagebrush, this used to be bighorn sheep winter range. Okay, over in the elk. <coughs> What's it full of now? <coughs> Young Douglas fir. Why did that get in there? Disruption of the natural fire cycles in that system. <clears throat> these begin to be things that we can do to conserve these grasslands. Stealing some 
data from my colleague Carl Womble. <coughs> Again, real data. When you read this graph, when we have a lot of Douglas fir canopy cover, we don't have much sagebrush. Very little Douglas fir canopy cover, we have a lot of sagebrush. Here's a photograph. <coughs> Ran a fire up through there. Very little, if any, damage to the Douglas fir. 70% mortality in the mountain big sagebrush. That's mule deer winter range. What did we just do to the mule deer? By killing all that sagebrush in there. Okay. Yeah, more grass for me. More grass for them to eat. Except when do mule deer really zero in on grass? Early spring, why? You're right, early spring, why? It's very short. Mule deer have a very tender nose, right, Harold? Very, very tender nose. They don't like to get stuck in the nose with the grass stalk. So they like those early spring grasses because they're not getting poked. Or, you run a herd of cattle or a herd of bison through here in midsummer and you get a little regrowth and then the deer come in and graze. But when the snow gets deep, they can't get to the grass. Okay. The mule deer consume a lot of sagebrush given the opportunity. <clears throat> so in this this is Jerry Creek over off the big hole. Okay. Negative impact to mule deer because we lost that sagebrush. <coughs> so if we see our grass communities degrade, our shrublands fall apart, what we really are looking at, folks, is dwindling resources to support these wildlife populations that we hold so dear. There just is not enough groceries for them. So what do we do to prevent that? to prevent the loss of these populations. Here are the actions I'm going to propose tonight. I'd like you to think about. We can deal with fire severity and we can deal with fire spread. And notice I don't have the U.S. Forest Service and the BLM in here fighting fires. This is pre-fire, preemptive effort. <clears throat> Under fire severity, our goal is to reduce fuel loading. If we reduce fuel loading, I'd pick on Amanda, but she gets all embarrassed and won't say anything. If we reduce fuel loading, then the fire is less intense. It doesn't burn as long. The temperatures are lower, and the grasses are better able to survive the fire. What can we do? Well, at the landscape level, today, <clears throat> we have to talk about mechanical thinning. I like prescribed fire. I am Smokey the Bear's arch nemesis. You know, he's putting them out. I'd like to start them. But we have to be realistic that our forest, our shrub communities are so degraded that to allow fire to get into them now is going to cause significant environmental damage. So our first step is going to have to be mechanical thinning. The next step is to contract controlled grazing. Livestock are brought in to accomplish specific <coughs> ecosystem goals and benefits. The reduction of fuel, okay? At the community level, this is down smaller, closer to home, prescribed fire. Targeted grazing are very small groups of animals for very short periods of time, possibly using electric fence uh, to hold them in a certain area to accomplish something. <clears throat> then we can work on fire spread. Fire spread quickly across the landscape because of two factors. One of them, of course, is wind. But the second one is the continuity and fuel load. And this floor is a great example. If I set a Douglas fir 12 feet tall, uh -oh, 14 foot wide canopy right here, and another one the same size at that table, 
and I set this one on fire, and Bruce doesn't call the fire department, how likely is that tree to burn? Seems silly, but very unlikely. Why? Because there's no fuel bed continuity between these two trees. So we can use prescribed fire in these environments to reduce that fuel bed continuity and to keep it down. If you don't like prescribed fire, we, we bring our herbs in. Because fire and grazing are what shape plant communities or grassland communities. <clears throat> Here's just some quick benefits. <coughs> Uh, and the BLM does not teach their forestry and range people to take good photographs. But this is the lodgepole fire last year. Uh, this was, had been a prescribed fire three years prior. The big lodgepole complex blew up, moved through this country. Green trees. This burned. But when that fire came roaring over the hill, it laid down, it went down through the grass and left the trees alone. This was an untreated stand. You can see all the little dog hair pondos in there. It killed most of the big trees. So one of the benefits is firefighting. All of the BLM people and the ranchers I've talked with in that lodgepole complex said, had it not been for those prescribed fires, Lodgepole would have made it to Lewistown. Those were the fire breaks that stopped it. This is a fire we conducted in Dry Arm Mills Creek in the breaks. This is two years after we put prescribed fire in it. If I had not told you that that had been burned, would you have picked that out as a burn? You know, these little trees might have just died of disease, but we killed them with fire. Here's, everyone tends to be very excited about diversity. So here's the diversity out of that Dry R. Mel's fire. Looking at the different burn units, that's what BU means, burn unit. LC and UC are the unburned controls. <clears throat> The taller the column, the more diverse the plant community is. Ecological paradigms are high ecological diversity means the community is pretty ecologically stable. With fire, we increase the biotic diversity in those stands with prescribed fire. So a benefit to the community. Here's our problem. <clears throat> our Native American Citizens knew this 10,000 years ago. Fire attracts big game. <clears throat> they manipulated where the animals were, how many were there, by setting fires. So our challenge is to put these prescribed fires in, and what we've done is just created a great dinner plate. So the recovery patterns now <clears throat> following fire are going to be altered by both climate change, but with excessive grazing, they're going to be slowed. So here's a new concept that's coming on. It seems to be working very, very well. It's called patch grazing. I burn a patch. One year, two years later, the herds are attracted to grazing. Oh man, they're just going to graze it into the dirt. They're going to ruin it. <clears throat> but two years later, three years later, I move over here and I burn another patch and what do the animals do? They move to it, vacating this spot. This spot now can recover. And then what do I do? I burn another patch and I rotate my herds simply with fire. And I get the benefit now of this area that's been grazed first. The fuel load is now broken up. We don't have a continuous fuel bed. We have very little litter. <clears throat> Should we get a lightning strike after the herds have left, that one probably won't burn severely or burn for an extended period of time. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> and finally, this is the most controversial one, is if we only have so much habitat, we have to bring the population into balance with that resource. Okay? This is the Gardner Basin. The red line represents the tops of the watersheds. Those mustard yellow patches are suitable bison habitat and all the red dots are where we sampled. And the point I'm trying to make here is there is only so much bison habitat in the Gardner Basin. And we haven't even taken into consideration the elk pressure there. So to conserve these grasslands, we have to address that grazing pressure. The end point of all of this is I think we have some management tools and approaches that we can conserve these iconic wildlife species. They're available to us. We can interact or, or put these on the ground this spring. We don't have to wait for Congress to decide whether or not there's climate warming, okay? So with that, I have to thank, I would like to thank, I don't have to thank, I would like to thank the agencies that provided me money for this, uh, the graduate students and undergraduates that uh, helped me collect the data, kept me alert to grizzlies, uh, fortunately, I, I didn't ever have to try to outrun any of them uh, over that. So, with that, I don't know, Madison, Bruce, do we take questions? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have an entire computer full of all sorts of data to back all of this up. I didn't want to keep you any longer. But if there are questions, I would be happy to try to answer them. <laughs>